Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Jammy History Podcast, the show that aims to spread the truth about the history that you didn't know. I'm your host, Jamie, and today we're taking that slogan to a whole new level because we're talking about something that I don't even know about myself. But don't you worry, because I brought in someone who does know about the subject. Say hello to Rosie. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Freezing, but we're going to push on uh, and have a good time talking about the wonderful world of women's racing drivers in the 1930s. So Rosie is from the Brooklyn's Museum. Do you mind telling us a little bit about the Brooklyn's Museum for those of the viewers who do not know about it? So Brooklyn's Museum is the based on the site of the world's first purpose-built motor racing track. So um, it was built in 1907 and it opened for racing. It was a place where loads of records were broken. There was also aviation going on, but that's like another side of the story. Um, But yeah, basically it was the place to be back in the kind of 1900, like, you know, 1907 to 1939 is when Brooklyn's ran as a racetrack and people such as uh, the future King George was there, the future King Edward VIII, he attended Brooklyn's, um, all the society people would have been there. So it was not only a racetrack, but it was like the place on the social calendar where you wanted to be seen. So Uh, The museum kind of just celebrates the history of Brooklyn. So um, parts of the track are still there. Not all of it, unfortunately. Um, But there is a Tesco's now on on the site of where the track once was, because that's what everyone wants. You can get Um, a meal deal as you go through the course. Yes, exactly. And, you know, if you ever need a drink on your way out, there's a Tesco's just there. So all sorted. But yeah, the museum celebrates the history. So we've got old cars. We've got old aircraft so the aviation side actually ran from 1907 to about 1987 so we've actually got Concord because part of Concord was designed and built at Brooklyn's loads of aircraft there's a bus museum on site we've got it all like if you love history and if you love cars or even if you don't love cars there's so much interesting stuff going on like I guarantee any history lover will be amazed No, it sounds amazing, both as a great racetrack to have gone back to back in the day and also as a great museum now to see all the different kinds of vehicles there, the aviation stuff, and also, of course, the world's famous Tesco on the racetrack. What's not to love about it? But yes, so Brooklyn's has a big history with racing, and that is what we're all going to be focusing on today, Brooklyn's uh, association with racing and in particular with female racing drivers and women's connection with Brooklyn's. Obviously, you said aviation. If people love it, we'll do an aviation sequel. So everyone be excited and stay tuned for that. But without further ado, I guess we should move on to our our first uh, lady of the day. Yes, definitely. Do you want to say or do I want to say? What way around Uh, do you want to do? I'll announce. So this lady is the one and only Elsie Bill Wisdom. Yes, so Elsie or as she was more commonly known as Bill. Um, Apparently that was a childhood nickname that just kind of stuck. Um, So when I first heard about her, I thought it was a man because everyone's saying, oh, Bill Wisdom. So I was just assuming, oh, there's just some man called Bill. But actually it was a woman, um, but everyone called her Bill. So she started off her racing career at Brooklyn's. She was actually entered into her first ever race in 1930 by her husband. And basically, she didn't want to enter because she didn't want, not because she thought she might die or she might crash the car or anything like that. She didn't want to enter because she thought she might publicly humiliate herself if she did badly. Um, but she I got over that. The, uh, I can imagine the conversation <laughs> that the two of them had. Like she comes home one day and her husband's there, like, hello. <laughs> I've got a surprise for you. Yeah, I mean, it must have been a bit of a, like, I can't, I mean, you just wouldn't imagine it happening now, would you? Like, if I got home and my boyfriend's like, I've just entered you into, like, this really dangerous thing, I'd be like, do you hate me? (laughs) Yeah, that feels like he's setting up the, uh, you know, the easy (laughs) breakup right there. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But eventually it was well received. So she did race in the race she was entered into. So obviously she didn't take it as a sign of hatred. This was obviously 
a big sign of love. And she wanted to win, obviously. Um, that was like her main thing. Once she'd been entered into this race, she was like, right, I'm going to do it. But only if I win, which obviously you can't guarantee that, um, especially not in these old cars. A lot of the time things would go wrong, like engine failure or, you know, something falls off the car. So for her to think so strongly that she was going to win, um, she was obviously very determined. Luckily, she did win. So that made her continue with her racing career past this first race. She participated in lots of races at Brooklands. And like I said, there were times where she couldn't complete the races because of car faults. By the 1930s, um, some of the track at Brooklands was not, it wasn't falling apart, but there were some bumps that didn't necessarily help the cars along. And sometimes with the weather, Brooklands is based right next to the river. It's not necessarily the most ideal place for a racetrack in terms of weather and stuff like that. So often there were times where she had to kind of pull out of the races and stuff like that. But she continued. Um, I, her husband, I believe, was a, a racing journalist. So that that would have helped her career. Um, but she was but is really... Is that why he entered her in it? So that he could just write about his wife? Potentially. Maybe he was like, I've Look got Look at no what stories. my wife's doing. Isn't she great? <laughs> Isn't she amazing? <laughs> <laughs> I've got no stories. Hmm, what can I do? Um, maybe had like a little column, like the husband's view on the... <laughs> But yeah, so I I think basically they were just very interested in racing. And she actually had her daughter within her racing career. So with a lot of the women at Brooklands, they either had their families potentially. I mean, I don't know of many that had their families beforehand, because obviously, you know, you've got to be a certain age to have kids. And most people do the racing part in the first section. Um, it's not a but, midlife crisis to get into racing. No, I haven't seen many people that start older, although in the men's side of the racing, a lot of them were kind of you know, 30, 40, 50 kind of age. Um, but the women seem to be younger, but most of them gave up their racing careers to start their families. So a lot of the kind of things that we see is like, oh, they've gone and got married. They no longer race. Whereas uh, Elsie or Bill was completely different. She came back to racing after she had her daughter. I'm not sure how long she had off. I don't think it was very long, potentially like the pregnancy bit. And then it was straight back in. So that's like a really interesting thing about her. She was just really determined and she drove a massive car. So she actually had to prove herself to Brooklyn's officials and also John Cobb, who was the land speed record holder, that she could drive the car, which I think is just like a really strange thing because did John Cobb have to prove to anyone that he could drive a massive car? Uh, don't think I so. I have a feeling so what... the answer's no to that one. Exactly. So what was he doing trying to get people to prove that they can drive cars? Luckily, she did prove it. And we actually have a replica of the same car she would have driven in the museum at the moment so if any of your lovely listeners come to the museum they will be able to see the Leyland Thomas car it's a white creamy color so look out for it if you do come and visit and if none of them go then I'm definitely going to have a look at the car exactly but yeah so we I don't think we have many of Bill's you know things objects in our collection um but she did get a 120 mile per hour badge which is like that's prestigious if you got a brooklyn's 120 mile per hour badge you were you were a top dog on the track so she got one of those and she also benefited from the fact that she was racing at a time initially only women were allowed to race when she first started but by the end of the brooklyn's period men and women were allowed to race against each other which is a novel idea. Scandalous they, idea in the 1930s. I know, I know, but when Brooklyn's first opened, they modelled themselves on horse racing um, and female jockeys were not allowed. So they just went, well, female drivers are not allowed, done. So it took a long time for that to be overruled um, and to change the mindset because they didn't believe that women could handle the cars. Um, yeah, it was just a whole big thing. But Bill, with her uh, driving partner, Joan Richmond, actually won um, the 1,000 miles race at Brooklands, um, which was alongside men, and they were the only women in that race. And 
they finished three minutes ahead of second place. So I think that's pretty impressive. That is um, impressive. And a thousand miles. So the Brooklyn's racetrack, I think, was around three and a half miles. So it's a lot, <laughs> a lot of laps. So Particularly been... in these old cars that, uh, yes. you know, as you said before, you know, a lot of them would have like mechanical problems very often. So to go that uh, kind of distance in one of those cars is even more incredible. Yeah, exactly. I think most people have seen old cars. I mean, one, technology and all that, they never last. And even comfort, they they do not look comfy. They look quite horrible. And, you know, I don't necessarily think that they were like what Formula One drivers wear today with all their nice insulated body suits and all of the kind of comfort things that they have. So even just like that side of it is just insane that that, that they managed that I just I wouldn't be able to do it (laughs) that's why you got to get someone to sign you up for it on your behalf I mean please don't (laughs) (laughs) Rosie for the next Formula One World Championship we're gonna see it it's gonna happen I I feel like that I would have probably have the same opinion I don't want to embarrass myself (laughs) (laughs) but no great thing for uh, for Elsie Bill to do um I wish there was a film about it I feel like that would be a great subject for a film yeah I feel like a lot of these women drivers or like just in general there should be a film like why do we not have a film about them and even like I just like there's so many stories that you just find out like I'm sure I'll find something new out about Bill and be like oh my gosh even more for the film but I think because they're not mainstream we need to make it happen. We do need to make it happen. The change is beginning now. <laughs> this is the moment. That's what it's all about. Exactly. That is we'll get Netflix goal. on the line. <laughs> They're watching this right now. <laughs> They've already blocked my emails. I spam them that much with ideas. But I'll spam well, them more about this. This one might land. I think it would. I think there's a real market for this. <laughs> but that's uh, everything about uh, Elsie Wisdom. We can move on to our next fabulous lady. So introducing to the stage is the next wonderful woman and that is Jessie Ennis. So Jessie Ennis is a I I guess slightly different. She was actually a motorbike, motorcycle rider. So uh, slightly different vibe. Still on the racetrack. I would probably class the motorcyclists at Brooklands as more mental um, in terms of they were riding around on the massive track in their tiny bikes with like, I, I saw her helmet today. And I have to say, I do not think that it would have protected her if she had crashed. It was like... It's just for show. Honestly, it must have been. Like, I mean, in comparison to another helmet that was there, one of, one of the helmets was actually just a hat, um, like a, a, a nice velvet hat. That was for another racing driver. Uh, but the Jesse Ennis helmet, I thought, God, if I, if I knocked that a bit too hard, I think my... I know, obviously, it's nearly 100 years old now, but... Um, I can't imagine it was much stronger back in the 30s. So, yeah, I just class them as slightly more insane than the car drivers. Maybe they were, but in my mind, they are. I think, yeah, you definitely have to be uh, like a certain kind of crazy, a little bit, you know, more daredevil to do motorbike racing during this time than just driving around in the car. Both are exciting, but one of them's definitely got that extra level of danger. Yeah, exactly. And I think what we see from Jessie Ennis is that she is definitely a daredevil. So she got her interest in motorbikes uh, when her brother got a old like World War One motorbike. I mean, it wouldn't have been that old at the time, but obviously old enough that he managed to acquire it. Um, and he did it up. And he would drive it around, ride it. I keep saying drive and I, I'll get told off. <laughs> Everyone will be like, it's not, you don't drive a motorbike. And I'll be like, I know, you ride it. Um, but uh, so he would ride the bike and then he kind of taught her how to ride the bike. And I, I think this was when she was around 11, 12 years old. So she started riding the bike at 11 or 12 and it says like in the stuff I've read like she couldn't even reach the ground from the bike because obviously you think an adult they can put their foot on the ground to 
you know, I guess not stop themselves, but at least it's there if you need it. Whereas she yeah. was just kind of on the bike, <laughs> just holding on. Um, so, you know, that cements her as a bit of a daredevil already. Definitely. Um, if I, if she's already comfortable going on a bike, not being able to touch the ground, then she's definitely already set for the career. I wouldn't be able to do it. I need to have my feet on the ground at all times. Exactly. And yeah, I don't think many people can say they've learned to ride a motorcycle at 11. So she's definitely destined to start racing at Brooklands. So basically, by the time we get to the 1925, so she did a bit of racing and her brother also went into motorcycle racing. Um, but we get to 1925 and new Imperial um, the motorcycle company they, they were looking for a lady a lady rider um, and she applied and she was successful in getting this job um, it was unpaid but she basically had the factory backing her with the bike so she got a new motorbike motorcycle um, every single year and like they kind of helped with the production of this so improving it making it better just putting work in because obviously for a lot of these kind of motoring companies we see it with some of the other car companies they're using people it's like an influencer um, they use people to kind of market their products so we know with her if she started breaking records with this bike it would be like this was done on the new imperial bike so then um people would want to buy it um and like mg did it with their cars with a lot of the female riders because they saw a new market kind of coming in like wow if we can show women that they can ride a motorcycle and or you know they can drive a car and they can do amazing things then we're gonna be like absolutely winning at our marketing campaign and we're going to get more orders um so that's kind of where this unpaid job came from um it's, it's very not much a... like um it's very much like you know like modern uh racing when you always have like your cars divided up by like the factories that made them like ferrari and like mclaren and it's always like you know we designed this car we made it in our factory and the driver is just showing off how good it is yeah exactly it is basically exactly the same as that except from now lewis hamilton gets like millions of pounds in sponsorships <laughs> Yeah, so where was his where was his unpaid job, right? I, I don't yeah. see that poster going around. Exactly. You know, back in the day it was a hard slog to be a be taken a seriously in motorsport. Um but yeah, so I think like it's interesting that like you say, like you can see the parallels with some of the modern stuff that we do, like influencer marketing, that's basically the same. You know, F1 is all the same concept. It's it's not a new thing. It's, it's right, the, fun, the foundations have already been laid there for these very like modern seeming things. Yeah. And with a lot of this motor stuff, you can see the parallels with modern motorcycle racing with mo I mean, I don't watch motorcycle racing, but uh, you can see I'm sure you'd be able to see a lot of the similar things going on. But yeah, so Jessie Ennis, she wasn't able to race at Brooklands until the Essex Motor Club organised a ladies motorcycle race in 1929. There was people kind of petitioning for women's races and stuff. But I think, as I said, it's probably more dangerous. There's probably less people campaigning for it to happen um, because obviously female car races had already started happening kind of in the early 20s at Brooklands. So yeah she's kind of later into the Brooklyn's story there and she came second in her first race and she basically was an advocate a bit for kind of well I can do this I'm a woman we can do anything like men can do um which I really love because it's true like <laughs> it is true <laughs> there's no arguing with that statement no exactly um but obviously at the time there was a lot of people arguing um, and if you think like realistically, 1929, it's only really 10 years after women have got the vote. You know, World War One is only 10, 15 years ago. Like it's a kind of a time where things are changing, but actually we don't really see things really properly changing till maybe after the Second World War, um, which is <laughs> after Brooklyn's closes because Brooklyn closes in 1939. So it never reaped the benefits of the kind of modern society that we saw. So it's really interesting kind of seeing some of these women being involved with the story because it's not all that common in the kind of the 20s and stuff. And obviously with the outbreak of World War II, 
it did stop a lot of people's racing careers. I think, you know, how long did the war last? Like six years? If you were kind of in your 30s, at the outbreak of the war, by the time the war's over, you potentially don't want to continue racing because you feel too old or you've started a family. So it did kind of destroy a lot of careers. Um, but actually, after the Second World War, Jessie founded a motorcycle stunt team with her brother. <laughs> so cool. She dragged Pretty- him along uh, for the <laughs> ride, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no pun intended there. But yeah, that, this cements her as a real daredevil because I was reading that she would ride on her brother's shoulders and he would like stand on the saddle of his like motorbike. And then oh she God. also she also like rode through blazing hoops of like fire. So it was already very daredevil. Why is the blazing <laughs> hoops at the end? I, I don't know, but she just. She, she loved it you know and yeah I'm guessing like her brother was also a bit of a daredevil it would have been an interesting one to bring those two kids up I think imagine like having to watch out for them doing something with fire the parents must have been traumatized bringing both of them up yeah exactly it must have been horrific but yeah the good thing about Jessie Ennis is we do have a few bits of her trophies out in one of the sheds so again any listeners that visit Keep an eye out in the ERA shed near some motorbikes. There's a there's a nice cabinet with some trophies in, and that's Jesse Ennis's. We also have her helmet in our archive. But if you follow Brooklyn's Museum on social media, you might you might see a little clip of it come up very soon. Oh, that's a cheeky plug, and we'll allow it. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone, make sure to keep your eyes out for that. I'm definitely going to be keeping my eyes out for it because uh, I need to see this helmet. I I was a bit shocked. <laughs> daredevil from the start daredevil with the helmet daredevil as a kid daredevil on the shoulders of her brother with the blazing hoops i can't get that image out of my head that's gonna stay with me for days now (laughs) i haven't actually seen a picture of the brother i've only seen a picture of her so i don't know if he's like massive small like i i can't i just can't imagine how it works i almost hope that he was like the exact polar opposite to her and he was only going along to try and like dissuade her out of doing it like please this please stop this is getting a bit ridiculous and she's on the top like no brother faster (laughs) maybe i mean that would be hilarious if that was true oh if only if only but regardless another great story another great netflix pitch exactly but now we can move on to the third wonderful woman of this evening and that is kay peter So Kay Peter, I feel like I really like the concept and learning more about her because she was basically a celebrity. She was the star. She was a star of Brooklyn's. There's so many photos of her. Like she was a very attractive woman and just like everything you hear about her, just I have this image of how she would have been. She was four foot ten. So just imagine her. There's lots of pictures of her. In her massive, like, I think it's like a 10 litre delage. And she had to have wooden blocks on the pedals so she could reach them. And the pictures of her standing next to them are hilarious. The car comes up to her, like, shoulders. So her sitting inside it is just ridiculous. Um, But she managed it. She was really well known for being well dressed. She used to wear kind of blue silk overalls and she would normally be driving a light blue car as well. That was part of her image. And I've heard kind of stories about her, like, you know, she'd like picture would be taken for her, like doing her lipstick before the the race and stuff like that. So she was very much kind of really, yeah, the celebrity of the track. She was one of the women that everyone was like, wow, she is like amazing. And she was also a good racer. It wasn't just the looks and the personality. She was also a very good racer. And I think she set some lap records. um, And she also got one of the really exciting badges. She got the 130 mile per hour Brooklyn's badge. 
So We've got even, 125, we have to go one step up now. Yeah, exactly. 130 miles per hour. Um, at the time, I mean, now we're saying that we think, oh, Formula One car, 130 is like, you know, just that in slow mo. But no, in back in the day, 130, that was revolutionary. That was like a big thing to go at 130 miles per hour. No, definitely. Tiny woman, massive car, hurtling down the road. Definitely sounds like it was one hell of a sight. Yeah, I can just imagine how amazing like it would have been to see her. And she was actually one of, I think she was one of only two women to get the 130 mile per hour badge and one of only 15 men. So it was a great achievement at a the time. A very prestigious club to be in then. Yes, and I'm sure that she would have reaped the benefits of getting even more publicity for achieving this. And throughout kind of, I think she started racing in uh, 1933 um, at Brooklands. It was her husband that actually got her into it as well because he bought he bought her a race car. I think that's a nice gesture. Um, and she continued up until 1937 um, when unfortunately during a practice race at Brooklands, she was driving along the banking. So if anyone's ever seen any videos or pictures of the banking, it's like a 30 foot high slab of concrete. Um, so that's, right. the, that's the banking, basically. So you've got like the banking that goes like, you know, like a curve, like a racetrack. And then you've kind of got the finishing straight and then you've got like a railway straight. There's loads of different straights and curves and stuff like that. Um, but she was up on the banking and on a car's overtaking her, um, a much bigger car than hers, and it stalled and slid down and hit her car and knocked her off the track. And she was seriously injured at the time. She was in a coma, like it was proper serious. And really serious and injuries that <laughs> proper serious. And you can imagine they didn't really have proper helmets or protective gear. So crashes and Stuff like that were often tragic because, yeah, they just didn't have, they just didn't realize to protect yourself, you need a proper helmet. That didn't go through their minds. So, luckily, she survived this crash and she had a bit of paralysis in her face, uh, but she made like a full recovery, but she didn't race again after that. But just to tell you the tragic, I just, I was reading this and I was like, this is actually unbelievable that this happened. Oh, she God. came she came to Brooklands to watch a race with her friends as you do it was the place to mm. be seen it was a great social occasion and a car came off the track and hit her and her group of friends oh um, god <laughs> So she again had serious head injuries and had to go to hospital. One of her friends tragically died um, and others had serious injuries. But that was actually a thing quite not quite often. It was it was a bit rare, but cars could come off the track into the crowd because you imagine coming off a 30 foot high banking. Yeah. You could go, you know, um, and people often ended up kind of in the river or like just in random places. And. It wasn't just at Brooklands that cars would make it into the crowd. It happened in lots of races, um, but obviously they didn't have the crowd control like what we have today. So they don't have um, like the massive fences <laughs> that like you know block your view as they extend up into the sky or anything like that. No, no, they didn't have that. So yeah, that that happened to Kay Peter. Um, and then just just because I thought this is even more unbelievable, she recovers from. Don't don't tell uh, me she gets hit a third time. Right? Oh, oh, we can't no. have a third accident. <laughs> so she recovers from the the getting hit by the car off the track, um, and she became a motoring journalist um, after her racing career. And she was driving a group of journalists to an event, and lost. I I don't know if she lost control or whether they were hit by another car. It was a terif uh, horrific accident and she suffered more head injuries. Oh, so yeah, three accidents within kind of a very short space of time there. Um, and I was reading it. I was like, this is so unbelievable. Who who does this happen to? That is so unfortunate. Like, you know, once is bad, twice is really unfortunate. Three times, it's just a bit ridiculous by that point. Thank God she didn't actually need a good helmet because apparently there was some sturdy stuff going on with her head. Yeah, and you think considering she was so tiny um, that 
actually, you know, her head might not be strong, but apparently it was made of steel because three accidents. And I'm pretty sure she died when she was in her 90s. So obviously he didn't do anything to her. It was just, you know, just, oh, that's just another accident. Oh, well. Just brush it off. Exactly. And the doctors were there like, oh, for God's sake, what now? <laughs> she probably had like a loyalty card, you know, like the amount of time <laughs> she was, she was there. <laughs> The exact, she pro- you know, she probably was. But yeah, I mean, I thought the accidents, you know, unbelievable. Um, but after her racing career, she was the first woman to be accepted into the British Guild of Motoring Journalists. Um, and this was a career that she continued. And during the Second World War, because she was obviously a great journalist, um, she joined the Ministry of Food and wrote advice about how to use food and like how to, I guess, grow food um, for families who were suffering with food shortages. Um, and then she continued writing a food column for the Daily Sketch and then was a motoring correspondent for the Daily Graphic after the war. And in the 1950s, Austin, the car company, invited her to be a colour consultant for a new range of cars. And then in the 70s, she also helped advise the internal interior colours um, and like look of the minis um, because they wanted it to appeal to women. So they got her in. Well, I mean, what a great consultant to have. And I'm pretty sure she made sure to you know, make sure the car was sturdy in case she crashed another one, just in case. But no, good consultant to have uh, when you're designing the interiors of cars like that. Yeah. And I actually looked up a picture of the Austin car that she was involved with. I can't remember what it was called. Um, but some of the interiors of a few of them I looked at were light blue. And I was like, oh, that's okay. It's a signature mark. Exactly. It's classy. Women love it. And I really like the fact that she kind of kept her career going in the motoring world because, as I said, after the Second World War, a lot of people kind of just faded away, didn't continue. But I love that she was still involved, in, even in a small way, in kind of the future of motoring because she was such an important figure at Brooklands, not just Brooklands. Obviously, she was in other races but she was such an icon of the 30s I'm so glad that she didn't just leave it all behind that she did you know influence a car that we've all heard of she does sound like an amazing vigil I would have loved to meet her I think she was she sounds like a a great person just to talk to not a great person to be in the same car with but a good person just to talk to outside the racetrack yeah I think she was Canadian as well I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty certain she was Canadian and yeah she just seems really friendly and someone who kind of maybe was although she was a serious racer she had a bit of fun with it which I like Mm. because you know a lot of the male stars at the time were just racing 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 and I like having that bit of a story a bit of a personality shine through into her racing career no yeah she does seem to inject a lot of her personality into that career because yeah it just makes it a lot more interesting to talk to and she's a lot more memorable now as a result of it and obviously when she became a reporter after her time behind the wheel ended she was able to have her personality on full display and still talk about the things she loved which was racing yeah exactly and I think a lot of people didn't go into kind of journalism and stuff like that but it makes perfect sense like if it's like football pundits you know they're all ex-footballers so why didn't you know I I think it makes perfect sense and I think she probably had a really interesting column that she would write about motor stuff because she really understood it. Do you have any of the stuff that she wrote about then at the museum? Or what stuff from about her do you have? So we have some of her badges out on display. So the I think we have the 130 mile per hour one. And I literally was taking photos of them and I, I can't remember which ones. Um, But there's in a little cabinet in the ERO shed, there's um, some of her badges. We don't actually have that much collection items of her. I think when Brooklyn's kind of ended and people don't envision that a museum is going to open of these things um and so a lot of objects either have gone missing or they turn up randomly or private collectors also own a lot of car stuff so yeah we don't have huge amounts of her stuff and obviously with a lot of the cars a lot of these iconic ones are like long gone or they're in really bad condition so even some of the iconic male racers you know their cars just aren't about anymore and um, we're really lucky to have some of the iconic cars but a lot of them did not survive past the 30s and yeah I think well, there's some pictures of her in the museum um so we have a ladies reading room 
um, which is modelled off the original ladies' reading room that would have been at Brooklands during the racing days. Um, and there's some stuff in there about her and like some, I think there's a nice hand-drawn cartoon and stuff. But I'm I'm not sure where her, her personal archive is. It would be interesting to actually see it. I'd love to see if like her blue racing overalls still survived or whether they're kind of lost to time. Well, if you're listening in and you have all that material, then please let us know. We need to see it. We want to see it. It would be great to see those kinds of things brought out again, I guess, into the light, into the public eye. Yeah. And I mean, I, I can't speak for Brooklyn's because I, I work in marketing, not acquiring collections. But, you know, we love displaying everything we can to do with motoring. So, you know, if it did exist, then it would be amazing. Yes. So if you have any stuff, get in touch with Brooklyn's Museum. They'll happily take it off your hands and put it out on display for people to see. In the meantime, while you're rooting around for the uh, the physical archival stuff, you can check out the museum to see all the other good things that they are doing for this month. Because obviously it is Women's History Month and Brooklyn's in particular have been doing something very exciting for it, haven't they? We have. So this month we're posting as many videos as we can. I think it's one every day, but that's subject to no tech failures because you know what it's like. You schedule something and then it disappears into the ether. But yeah, we're posting videos about all the women. It's not all the women of Brooklyn's, but lots and lots of the women. So Obviously, Kay Peters is one of them. Elsie Wisdom is one of them. But then there's also loads of other amazing names like Ethel Lock King, who was the founder of Brooklyn's. There's Hilda Hewlett, the first woman to get her pilot's license, uh, the first woman in the UK to get her pilot's license, which she got at Brooklyn's. We even talk about, we're even going to talk about Amelia Earhart. She had a connection to Brooklyn. So there's literally just so many fascinating women in Brooklyn's history. And we're just going to be talking about them all month. I know with Women's History Month, it's like talk about women all year round, but we do try and bring out the stories of the women as much as we can. This month, I just thought it'd be super cool to dedicate it to the women, but they're definitely not forgotten in the Brooklyn story. They're definitely still very well remembered. And as I said, we do have lots of objects and stuff on display from some of the women who did work and race and are part of Brooklyn's. So although you know, it looks like this month is all we're doing. We do love talking about the women of Brooklyn's, but this month especially, we're going to bring out all the stories we can. And then anyone who we've forgotten, we'll save them for next year. Yes. So you get to see them all year round if you follow the Brooklyn's social pages. I've already been seeing what uh, has been coming out for the past week. And I've been loving every bit of it. It's always great to see a nice little like daily nugget now at this point. What's the great woman we're going to talk about today that's connected with Brooklyn's? And I look forward to seeing what the rest of the month has in store. And everyone should also check it out and enjoy it as well. Yeah, if you love history, it's just a nice little snippet. And we're well, we've tried to get as many women who work for Brooklyn's as well to narrate them narrate the videos so I mean I'm doing quite a few of them because I am the digital marketing officer so that's kind of comes with the territory but actually loads of women across the organization are also getting involved to help create these videos which I think is also really nice yes it's all good thing and I look forward to seeing more of what comes out and I just want to say thank you Rosie for joining us on the podcast it's been a blast it's been great having you on I've loved hearing about all these fascinating women and I can't wait to hear more about them. And hopefully everyone that has been listening to this also has enjoyed it. And then they'll check out the Brooklyn's Museum. Yeah, just follow Brooklyn's Museum. We're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, basically all the platforms. And we're in Weybridge and Surrey in case anyone's listening and they don't Google. If you maybe you live next next door, who knows? I will include links to all of them in the description of this episode. Much further below the list, you'll see all my socials linked. Don't click on any of them. They're the unimportant ones. Click the ones above them. Click all the Brooklyn's ones. And thank you all for listening. And we will see you next time, uh, whenever that be, for the aircraft special. That's what it will be, aviation special. Hope everyone does well until that day comes out.
Hello, hello, it is Editor Jamie here, ready to sign off this episode with a couple of closing remarks that I should have included in the original recording. This is the first of a couple of collaboration episodes that I have planned to come out over the coming months. The first that you will see is another one of the glorious film reviews that I have done with a Cloak and Dagger podcast and a Little History podcast, where we review the film Gods of Egypt. It is a terrible film, but we all have a great laugh whilst making the episode. And hopefully, you'll all have a great laugh when you listen to it, and maybe if you watch the film, though I would not recommend it. We also have some guest speakers coming in over the coming months, one to talk about mythological beasts, and another one who is going to talk about Chinese mythology. Both are going to be very exciting episodes, and I look forward to when they come out. If you like the show, please let me know. Check out any of my socials, all the links for them will be included in the description. And also, check out my Patreon. Join the Jammy Army, like the wonderful Historic Hills, Lara, Hannah, and my very own dad have. And with that, I leave you until the next episode. Take care all. Take care all.